Church said, Amen. It sounded really good, y'all. I'm telling you right now, it sounded really, really good. Good morning, church family. Appreciate the presence of each and every one of you here this morning. Uh, I want to thank, even though they're not here, I want to thank Matt and Al for helping me uh, last Sunday while I was incapacitated. Uh, I was, I was very bad sick, and. Uh, we, uh, but Michelle took real good care of me, and and now I'm I'm, I'm back in the, and uh, want to thank you all for, for that, for praying for me and everyone, anything else, and the calls and the phone calls and the visits and everything. Um, want to say that uh, we've got a lot of things going on, and uh, of course. Uh, we are heartbroken a little bit because of our mighty Franklin Lions are not out of the playoffs, but we can't be any more prouder than for those boys and all those kids who work and play sports and represent, represent the Franklin Lions on the football team. Uh, we are so thankful that they got as far as they did and uh, know that Norman G. also uh, had so we have some uh, our family members from Normandy who they're also uh, too out of the playoffs and and uh, we want to say that hey we're proud of them with us too uh, but hope still remains because the mighty Bremont Tigers are still looking looking for a, looking for a championship and so we are so proud of our friends and our family members from Bremont, and we wish you the best of luck as y'all keep on going. And uh, so, Hadley, speaking of Bremont Tigers, honey, I need you to come up here for a second, buddy. <clears throat> About two or three weeks ago, Hunter took on Christ in baptism. And one of our traditions here at Franklin is, is that when someone becomes a Christian, we want to make sure that they are armed well. So... Hunter, we, on behalf of the Franklin Church of Christ, I'd like to present you with a, a good NIV study Bible. The Bible is sharper than any two-edged sword, so use it wisely. Yes, sir. Congratulations. Thank you. Let's give my hand. Every house, every house has that doorpost that um, or door where you take your you know you, you look you look at your kid and you say ah, I think you've grown a little bit since we've let's, let's see how you measure up and so you take the young man or the young girl and you you say you know you put them up against the door frame and you say stand up straight now and then you take your little pencil and you mark on it to see how tall they are and then you you break out the tape measure to see and then maybe then you write their name and you write their age, and you write, you know, what the measurement is on that. Uh, we did that at our house back in Dudley. Uh, we had a whole door where, where, and and what was ironic was that there were some other grandkids who, the the house that Michelle and I lived in um, when we had our first, when we had McKenna, and man Jackson both when we were, um, was occupied by my brother and his family as well. So almost every almost. Uh, like two or two or three generations lived in that same house, and there's a lot of history. And so we put our mark on there as well. And uh, we did it also when we were in Eastland, as they kept growing. We had the door frame marked where how big, and we all have done that. We all, all want to see how they measure up. Um, I think the question that I'd like to ask you this morning is, how does your God measure up? How big is God? You know, we've been studying how Peter walked on the water. And this we're wrapping up our, our series of lessons this Sunday on that. And we've discovered a lot of things, a lot of messages that we could pull out of Peter walking on water. We discovered that Jesus is calling all of us to get out of the boat, to go off on faith, 
to stay focused on Christ. And as long as we can do that, we, there, is, there is nothing we can't do. And as a church, I think that's a very important message for every one of us to understand is that Christ is calling us as a church, as Christians, to take that leap of faith, to get out of the boat and get to work serving the Lord and serving one another. But the other important message that I want to that I want to that we definitely cannot ignore is this that our God our God is big enough to calm our, our fears and to calm our storms. Did you notice that when when Jesus uh, when they, when they become afraid in, in Matthew 14, and, and they're talking about, hey, what is this? It's a ghost. And what does Jesus normally do? The first thing He does is He calls out to them and He says, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Verse 27 of Matthew chapter 14. The words that Jesus used at, for Himself is, as I is the same word God used when he's talking to Moses at the burning bush. And Moses asks the Lord, Hey, who am I going to tell them sent me? And God says, You tell them the I am sent you. Jesus is using that same terminology and that same phrase to explain who is out here walking on water in the storms ready to take care of whatever problems his disciples are facing. This is not an ordinary address. This is a calling to his disciples to say, it's okay, I'm here. It's to calm the followers who are in his boat. I would submit to you this morning that the way you live your life determines the size of your God. Just so you didn't misunderstand when I say that again. The way you live determines the size of your God. If your God is small, you will live in fear and you will live in anxiety. Let me tell you how I, how I think about this. When your God is small... You offer prayers without faith. When your God is small, you work without passion. You serve without joy. And you suffer without hope. I came home from school one day. I drove in, pulled into the house, and I came in and Dad was sitting at the kitchen table and he said, Son, he says, uh, as soon as you get your clothes changed, I got, a, I got a job for you. So go get your clothes changed, put your work clothes on, and come on down, and well, I'll tell you what I need to do. So I said, yes, sir. So I come back down, and Dad said, all right. He said, there's a, there's a cow down at the Barton place. He's in the pens. He says, I need you to hook up the truck and the trailer. I need you to go in there and get that cow and bring it back to the lot. So I said, okay. And as I'm walking out the door, he says, oh, by the way, he says, take the dog with you. I said, yes, sir. And I, our dog, was, his name was Ben, and he was a red-blue healer mixed with a dingo. Very good cow dog. Um, and so I get Ben. He knows, where, he knows where we're going. If the truck's turned on, he's in the back of the truck. It's kind of like Billy, Billy's dog. And, uh, you know, here we go. We go down, pull up to the lots where, in, in this pasture land, and there's, there's this cow in the pen, and she ain't looking too happy. I got the trailer backed up. I get my working stick out, and me and Ben proceed to go into the lot to get this cow to load up in this trailer. The gate was open, very big gate. I was on one side of the cow. Ben was on the other. And uh, the minute I said, get up, cow, the fight was on. The cow would come at me, and I'd whack it in the head with my stick, and Ben would bite it on the rear end. The cow would then get mad, turn around and go after Ben. Ben would bite it on the nose and I'd whack it in the rear end. Then we went around, around those lots for about 30 to 45 minutes. One time Ben got knocked underneath the fence. One time the cow put me into the fence. By the time we got done, everything in the middle was fine, but the cow on both ends was blue and bloody and beat up. 
knuckles scratched up and everywhere. Finally, the cow decided, you know what? I think I'm going to have enough of this. I think I'm going to go get in the trailer. We got it loaded up. Drove back to the house. I'm backing up into the lots, and Dad comes out to meet me. And I get out, and I am head to toe in dust. My shirt's all torn to shreds. I don't know what happened to my cap. Ben, the dog, gets out, and the first thing he does is he lays down in a, in a water puddle because he's so hot, and his tongue's hanging out the side of his mouth. We've been working. Dad looked at me. He said, did you get him? And I said, yes, sir, we got him. And I said, Dad? He said, yeah. He said, I don't think we need to unload her. <laughs> I think we need to leave her right where she is. <laughs> Dad says, yeah, I think you're right. So the cow spent the night in the trailer, and we took it to the cell the next day. The point is, though, is that I'm very glad that I took that dog with me. Or I would have had more trouble getting that cow to get inside the trailer. I had backup. Do you know that God, in the same way, backs you up? Do you let God back you up? Do you allow God to be a part of your life so much that when we want some backup, we know that our God is big enough to help us in any of our situations? If we do know that, then it changes every single concept of our lives. It changes how we treat our spouses. It changes how we work. It changes what we believe. I'll even go as far as to say it changes how we worship. Because if we know God is, has our back, and our God is big enough, then it changes what we think about when we worship. We live in a world that does not promote worship at all. Used to. Used to on Sundays. You knew where everybody was. Businesses were closed down. Used to on Wednesday nights, coaches would let their kids go home early and not have a long, drawn-out practice of baseball, volleyball, basketball. On Wednesday nights, you had a short practice so you could go home and get to church. Used to, preachers would sit on board meetings and would ask, hey, what's the church think about this? A lot has happened since then. We do live in a world that does not have any care or respect of worship. A lot of us, there's a lot of people who go into the worship of the Burger King, it's called, I call it the Burger King religion, where you can have it your way. You can do whatever you want, when you want, no matter how you want to do it, just as long as you're there doing it with us. Why do we insist on worship?